Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, get excited. We got to get excited for what God's doing in our lives, amen? Hallelujah. Come on, praise his holy name. Come on, you got to shout, shout hallelujah. You got to lift up your hands. Go ahead and lift up your hands. Welcome, welcome, family. Welcome. Come on in. I know it's the middle of the week, almost the end of the week. Get excited for what God is doing, amen? For God is so good. Everybody on Facebook and YouTube just want to say hello to you. Welcome to Turning Point Fellowship on behalf of Pastor Angel. Bienvenidos a Turning Point Fellowship. Welcome everybody here. You made it. Give yourself a round of applause because you're here. You're here. Amen. All right. We're excited. We're, before we move forward, we, we've got some announcements coming. All right. Here's our, our men's meeting. Man, where you at? We got our men's meeting coming up this Saturday. Come on, man. Where you at, man? Let me tell you. Stay connected, man. It will change your life. It will change your life. It will change your attitude. It will change your character. It will change you completely. It will change your heart. Amen? So come on now. Uh, we got potluck going on. Now we got the women's meeting. Woman, where you at? Woman, where you at? Come on, ladies. Hope to see you here. Come on down. Join the ladies. Fellowship. Some good words. Some good food. Make new friends. People you don't know, I, I encourage you to talk to somebody new. Talk to somebody you don't normally talk to. It's beautiful when you get to know this person. And you're like, wow, it will change your life. Amen? Ooh, our Easter Sunday service. How many of you are excited for that? Come on now, guys. Come on now. We're going to um, bring some of the people from the community Come and share what God has doing, done in your life. Come and just love on people. Your love will change people. Come on out. Amen? Everybody here with me? Everybody here with me? All right. Come on. We got to celebrate Brother Fred. We got to celebrate Brother Fred. Just the way he used to walk in with a smile over here. Come on, guys. We got to celebrate his life. Amen? That will be on April 8th. So come on out, family. Come on out. Make some time and just come and celebrate my, our brother, our friend, husband, father, brother, cousin. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Anything else? Everybody good? Hallelujah. All right, guys. <sighs> Glory be to God. Glory be to God. I want to read something to you guys. That's before we get started. Amen. It says, um, Psalms 145. Psalms 145. It says, En el nombre del Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. I will exalt you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. And I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unreachable. One generation shall praise your works to another. And shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. And your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of the mighty of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness declare that greatness today they shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness the Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and great in mercy the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Let me tell you, is God working in your lives? Is God working in you? I'm a, I'm a work in progress. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you. I said, all your works shall praise you. Oh, Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Amen. Let's, let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. Let's praise his name.
As as we all know that Pastor Angel is getting ready for a big day tomorrow, amen? A miracle. I want you guys to just close your eyes right now. Pastor, I know you're watching, Pastor. We're right here with you, Pastor. Your people are right here with you, Pastor. Praying, lifting you up. Y dice el Señor así. Cuando levanto mis manos, comienzo a sentir una unción que me hace cantar. Cuando levanto mis manos, comienzo a sentir el fuego. Cuando levanto mis manos, mis cargas se van. Nuevas fuerzas tú me das. Todo esto es posible. Todo esto es posible. Cuando levanto mis manos. Todo esto es posible, todo esto es posible Cuando levanto mis manos Father, we just thank you, Father, for today, Father. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful life that you've given us, Father. We thank you for this day, Father, that we gather, Father, to worship you, Father. We, Father, we, we get rid of any distraction with, that's trying to pin us today, Father, any, any heaviness in our heart, Father, anything that, that just doesn't glorify you, Father, we get rid of it right now, Father, when we come and worship you today, Father. We thank you, Father, for the hearts that you're changing, Father, for the, the, the lives that you're changing today, Father, Lord, we thank you, Father. And as we worship you, Father, we give you our best right now. We're going to give you our best, Father. We're going to exalt your holy name, Father. We're going to lift your name up high, Father. We say praises to your name, Father, for the miracles and wonders that you're doing in this place, Father. In the name of Jesus, I say, Father, that throughout this worship, Father, there will be breakthrough, Father, and change will be broken, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, there will be healing, Father, all through this worship, Father, as we lift your name up high, Father. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you. We glorify you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen. And I say, come on and worship your God. Don't wait for the music to start. Just come and worship your God. Amen. Hallelujah. Gózate, gózate. I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. And I will bless the Lord. 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 Hope he rubbed it. Hope he rubbed it. Dark is shaking. Faith is rising. We know, we know, we know. Heart be racing. Living in your freedom. Joy overflowing. We know. The church is alive, the church is alive. Our hope, our hope forever is the name, in the name of Jesus. We are free and you are with us. The church is alive, the church is alive. Passion burning, passion burning. Vision growing, the church is bearing. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, our hope, our hope forever, in the name of Jesus, we are free and you are with us, the church 
is a lie, church is a lie, our hope forever is the name, the name of Jesus, we are free and you are with us, the church is a lie, church is a lie, hallelujah, let's give praise. Come on, this is what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. When the church is alive. Church is alive. This is what? This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. When the church is alive. Church is alive. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. And this is what it feels like when the church is alive. One more time. And this is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when the church is alive. Church is alive. Our hope, our hope forever. In the name of Jesus, we are free and you are with us. The church is alive, the church is alive. Our hope, our hope forever. In the name, in the name of Jesus, we are free and you are with us. The church is alive, the church is alive. I say the church is, the church is alive. The church is alive. When the church is alive. Church is alive. When the church is alive. When the church is alive. When the church is alive. Mom, this is what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when the church is alive. The church is alive. This is what? This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when the church is alive. The church is alive. This is what? This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. When the church is alive, the church is alive, our hope, our hope forever is the name of Jesus. We are free and you are with us. The church is alive, the church is alive, our hope, our hope forever is the name of Jesus. We are free and you are with us. The church is alive. The church is alive when the church is alive. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God.
keep singing, keep singing, way bigger, way bigger. Blind in the darkness. You are the way maker, way maker. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, I know that you're gonna work it out, my Lord. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Say that is who you are. That is who you are. Lord, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Yes, that is who you are. That is who you are. You are here turning lives around. I worship you. I worship Señor que solamente tú abres y te alabamos y te adoramos Señor te exaltamos te glorificamos Señor
need healing in their heart. Whose hearts have been broken and wounded, hurt, abandoned, forsaken. Come, says the Lord. Come, says the Lord, for I am here. Come, says the Lord, for I am here. For I will make a way. I will make a way. Will you trust me? I will make a way if you trust me. For I go before you, says the Lord. I go before you. And my glory is your rear guard. Never alone. Never forsaken. Will you trust me? Come, says the Lord. You're a way maker. You're a chain breaker. You're the way maker. Yeah. You're the chain breaker. You're a way maker. You're a
Come on, begin to speak those words. God is doing something for you. Open up your heart. God is doing something for you. Open up your heart. God is doing something for you. Open up your heart. Turn it right now, Lord. Right now, Lord. to you, Lord. Everything that's within me, Lord, I surrender it to you, Lord. Everything that's within me, Lord. Keep doing it, keep doing it, God is, God is, God is, God is, God is, God is, he's doing it, he's doing it. God is doing something. Sing that one more time, sister. God is doing something. Right now. He is up to something. God is up to something. God is doing something right now. Come on, sing it up. He is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. like a birthing ground right now family right here right here on this holy ground this is like a birthing ground there's somebody that's going to give birth tonight but in order to do that sometimes there's growing pains that you may have went through there's some pain sometimes you got to get out of your comfort zone 
you got to get up out of your seat. you got to take a knee. you got to get on your face. Believe God tonight. Don't stand there no more, family. Don't stand and be a spectator. Come to the altar and give God glory. There is more that I require of you. There is more that I require of you. See, what looks like emotion to some is actually the Spirit of God to most. <laughs> what looks like emotion to some is actually the Spirit of God to most. Those who hear the voice of the living God. Raise your hands before we go back to our seats, family. Lift them up high. Give God glory. However you decide you want to do it, give God glory. Give God glory tonight. Hallelujah. God is doing something in this house. He's doing something with his people. our time now's a chance for us to sow seed in this birthing ground now it's an opportunity for us to sow seed into this ground this miracle ground right now we can go ahead and take our seats family hallelujah to the king thank you Jesus Hallelujah to the living God. If we could pull up that scripture, my brother, Deuteronomy 8.18, please. Thank you, Father. Woo, what a time of worship. Amen. It's okay. Give him glory one more time. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy in uh, the English Standard Version, if we got that in the ESV. Um, now's our time, family, to give back. To give back. Amen. I got one amen. Now's our time to give back. Amen. Come on, somebody. Now's our time to sow. Amen? amen. This is our time. This is seed time and harvest. This is where we plant our seed. Amen. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, 
You shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, to our ancestors before. As it is this day. He's a faithful God. And he's the one that provides for us. He's the one that gives us the strength to go about our day. He's the one that's given us jobs, careers. Amen? He's the one that's given us the power and the strength to gain wealth. Amen? He's the one. Give him glory. That's right. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. And now we have our opportunity to be faithful. Because the beautiful thing about this is God always gives us time to honor him. And that's what he's doing here in our tithes and offering. He's given us an opportunity to show him honor. Amen? By our obedience, amen, to the word of God, it's time to sow. Amen? It's tithe and offering. If there's any children that know this number, I would love for you guys to holler it out. There they are back there. Praise the Lord. So if you don't have, uh, if my ushers can come, these handsome ushers will go ahead and take care of uh, passing out those envelopes for you. If you don't have a cast tonight, a check, or anything like that, you can go ahead and text GIVE to area code 714-477-7777. Three, six. One more time. 714-477-7736. Amen? And we don't take your offering here at Turning Point. You go ahead and bring your offering up. But pray on, over your offering. Believe God. Believe God. This right here is good ground. This is good ground right here to sow. Amen? So believe God. Pray over your offering. And bring your offering when you're ready, family.
I could have uh, the Sanchez family, if I could have the two of you come and pray for the offering. Here we go. We got more. Thank you, sir. Brother Jesus, Sister Miriam. Hallelujah to the living God. Father, first and foremost, we want to uh, give glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. Father, we want to thank you for all the blessings you give us, for uh, uh, blessing us with work, for blessing us with the roof over our heads, with blessing us with food on the table, Father. For anything that we take for granted, Father, that you you, you let us know and that, and that we may change that, Father. For all those that were, that were able to give them, for all those that weren't able to, uh, Father, that you bless them with work and, and just uh, bless their hearts, Father. Uh, thank you for this uh, fellowship, for all the brothers and sisters here tonight, Father, for Pastor Angel. And um, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. So we'll go ahead and release uh, our praise and worship team. Thank you so much for assisting us in entering in this evening, and we will release the children. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate our children. Amen. Hallelujah. Doctors, lawyers, pastors, evangelists, pastors, evangelists. Hallelujah. We're going to release the youth as well at the same time. Come on, somebody. Give them glory. Give God glory and, and celebrate your children. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah to the living God. And here we are, Thursday night Bible study. Praise the Lord. We're going to introduce one of our own, Pastor Joe. If you can come forth, man of God. Hello, family. Okay, everybody sit down. <laughs> we're going to get into the Word, and we're going to get fed. You bring a pencil and paper? You know me, I'm going to take you there. Okay, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you right now, Lord. And Once again, Lord, as we get into the Word, we pray the Word gets into us. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit has free reign to hear, Lord, that you're just going to bless each and every one of us. Speak to our hearts individually and as a family, Lord. Help us to not be hearers only, but doers, Lord. People that apply your word and love your word, Lord. We thank you for this time together. Bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. When I was in the service a million years ago, God, it was a million years ago. We, we had to know our enemy, you know, and one of the things they teach you is you not only got to know who the enemy probably is, but you got to know his weapons and how he works and what you can expect to come at you. And as Christians, it's the same deal. You got to know it. In the world, we're battling against three things. We're battling against the, wor the world. We're battling against our flesh. And we're battling against Satan. And what does Satan want to do? He wants to wipe you out. He wants to kill you. Spiritually, physically, any way he can, he wants to wipe you out. You're his enemy. Ephesians 6, 11, what does it say? It says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, secret to a good, uh, good defense, what is it? Good offense, right? You got to take the fight to your enemy. So, with that, I want you to look at Revelation 12, 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Now, first point I want you to think about. How does the enemy think? How does he work? 2 Corinthians says, don't be ignorant of this. In the Bible, there's five or six areas where they tell you don't be ignorant. Prophecy, the gifts, don't be ignorant. Five or six areas, this is one. Know your enemy. Whose devices are they talking about? They're talking about Satan's devices. Many believers, they don't even know who their enemy is. They're just sort of going through their day kind of scattered. 
We need to know our enemy. We need to know what his devices are. Now, the devil. Before he was the devil, who was he? He was Lucifer, the shining star. But the shining star, and I know you've heard this, some of my more educated in the word, he had what? He had an eye problem. Isaiah 14, chapter, or chap, Isaiah 14, verse 13, describes Satan. What does it say? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The book of Ezekiel gives you a little bit more on that on the, when he talks about the king of Tyre, but he's really talking about the power behind the king of Tyre, and that's Lucifer. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, he wasn't always bad. At one point, he started off really well. He was a worship leader in heaven, stunningly beautiful and really uniquely anointed. Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 15, give you more insight into this description of Satan. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was your covering. The sky was beautiful. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, brio, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrel and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub that covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. <sighs> Lucifer was not just a great musician. He was the music. This guy had tambourines for hands and a voice. He wasn't just the pipe organ. He was the mu musical instrument. But day after day, year after year, he's up there, he's praising God decade after decade for who knows how long. You think he has it made? He's the worship leader in heaven. One day he sits there and he begins to think, hey, why is all the praise only going one way? Why not some this way? This is a tendency that can creep into the lives of anyone in ministry when we start to think, I'm doing this, but nobody's appreciating me. Why am I doing it? Nobody's recognizing me. Day after day, year after year, I work in the ministry, I work at the back, wherever. It's a tendency that can creep in. You got to be careful. Lucifer's problem was an I problem, and it's a problem we have to watch out for because it's pride. Amen? Amen. Lucifer lost his position as the worship leader in heaven. What a great position, huh? So now... He became Satan, our adversary, the devil, the accuser. That's who he is. You think that was a drop? So every time we come together and praise and worship, what do you think happens with Satan? Drives him crazy. Why? It reminds him of where he used to be. You know when you walk into church and the praise and worship is going up and you just feel it? You just feel God's presence right here and you just go, yeah, this is it. I don't want to leave. I just want to stay right here, right now. This is it. He remembers that. He remembers that. He remembers leading praise and worship. And when he hears us praising and worshiping, it drives him crazy because it makes him remember where he used to be. That's... So how do you overcome the enemy? First point, praise and worship. Old Testament, and I'm going to do this to you a couple different times tonight. Old Testament is what? Pictures of New Testament principles, right? First one, Second Chronicles 20. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. King Jehoshaphat, surrounded by all the mites, Edomites, Amorites, Moabites. They got him completely surrounded. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. A man named Jezreel 
stands up and he says, don't fear, Jehoshaphat. The battle is not yours, but the Lord. There's no need to fight. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Second Chronicles, verse 20, what does it say? Or chapter 20. Instead of sending the soldiers into battle, first Jehoshaphat puts his choir out front. Puts the choir out front and they begin to sing. How's that for a strategy? Stephanie, Diego, Fernando, want you up front. We're going into battle. What am I taking? Take your guitar, take your keyboard, and you're right at the tip of the spear. So he puts the choir out front. What happens? The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, they were so confused when the praise and worship went up, they began to fight each other. Israel walks away the winner. They wiped each other out. As the praise and worship went out, they wiped each other out. Principle here, there's power in praise. There's power in praise. You, me, us, we were created to praise God. That's our whole mission, guys. That's our whole mission. It's not about what God can do for us. It's about bringing the Lord the praise and worship that he deserves. During the Great Tribulation, Satan is going to pour out his wrath on God's people, not us. Why? Because we're in heaven. He's going to be pouring out on the Jewish nation who are still down here. That's another story. But presently, Satan is up in heaven, and what's he doing? He's accusing the believers, accusing the brethren. Somebody's going to say, what? How's he doing? How's he up in heaven? I thought he was cast out. No. Job chapter 1, it says he still has access to heaven. He's still going up there. Later on, in the middle of the tribulation, Michael, the archangel, is going to war against Satan and his angels. And who wins? We do. He gets the battle. Satan's kicked out. But right now, Revelation 12.10 tells us that Satan continues to sit up there and talk trash, accusing the believers day and night. So what's he accusing the believers of? of not deserving rewards. He's sitting there putting doubts in your mind that, hey, you know what? I don't, you don't deserve this. You don't deserve to be blessed by the Lord. Later, in the middle of the tribulation, every believer is gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Two different judgments. There's the great white throne judgment. That's where unbelievers stand in front of. That's later. But this one, the great white throne judgment, or the great, Blah, blah, blah. The beam of seat of Christ is for what? It's for rewards. It's not the great white throne judgment. This is where we're going to sit. And what are we getting? We're getting rewards for everything that we did in life. That was good. It says everything will go into the fire and poof. Whatever you did with the right motive, you're going to come out and you're going to get a reward. The beam of seat. It's not a place where you get judged for your sin. Why? Why are you not getting judged for your sin? Because all your sins, past, present, future, every one of your sins was dealt with and it was paid for at the finished work on the cross. Amen? Thank God for that. Thank God that he took that off our plate completely. The judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat is where the rewards are given out. Crowns. That's going to determine your position in ministry for eternity and your reward. That's what you're going to take into eternity. And who's on the sidelines? Who's sitting over there yelling out, making snide remarks about your rewards? Who do you think? I've been watching you. I know him. I saw what Joe did. He's getting a crown. That's what Satan's going to do to every one of us. He's going to sit there and throw out these little trash-talking, snide remarks. Satan, in the middle of the tribulation, does this, but don't be deceived. Right now, what do you think he's doing? He's doing the same thing. How's he doing it? The same way he's accusing the people up in heaven, he's accusing you day and night right here. He tries to keep you from being used. He tries to keep you from being blessed. He keeps whispering in your ear. You're not worthy enough to be in ministry. You're not good enough. You're not good enough for your family to be blessed. You're not spiritual enough. Amen? Anybody ever feel that way? 
What's the solution? How do you overcome him here on earth, on a here and the now? The same way he's overcome in heaven, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, the dying to self. Now, I told you you're going to go back and forth. Exodus 12. It was, a blood, it was the blood applied to the doorpost that, that spared the firstborn and the death angel flew over. Remember that story in Egypt? They were spared. In the same way, God is still blessing you. He's blessing your marriage. He's blessing your family. Not based on how much you prayed or how good you've been. He blesses you based on your understanding of the power and total sufficiency of Jesus Christ's shed blood at Calvary. That is the basis. 1 John 2, 1 says the man that sinned, he has an advocate, a defense lawyer. Who is it? Jesus Christ. He's our advocate, he's our defense lawyer, and it's in him that we stand. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, constantly condemning us. What does Satan mean? Adversary. He's your enemy. And what did Jesus tell you to do with your enemy, your adversary? Matthew 5, 25, what does it say? Agree with him. Agree with him. The world says, put him up. The Lord says, put him down. Agree with him. Satan condemns you. Don't fight him. Just say, hey, don't sit there and say, I didn't mean it. You know, well, I'm not really that bad. I couldn't help it. Just say, you're right. You're right. I agree with you. The reality is I'm a lot worse than you're probably even bringing out right now. But Jesus died. And how many sins did he die for? Every one. For your past sins, your present sins, your future sin. Is there anything else he needs to die for? It's not about anything you did or you didn't do. It's about what he's done on my behalf. It's all about what? It's all about the blood. It's all about the blood. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So what's my testimony? What's your testimony? What's our testimony? Because it's all the same, guys. <laughs> David in Psalm 40, Old Testament. For anybody that says, don't read the Old Testament, that's the picture. you got to read the Old Testament to get the New Testament principles lived out in the life of the Old Testament believers. What did David say in Psalm 40? He rescued me from a horrible pit brought me out of miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. You can paraphrase it. He rescued Joe from a horrible pit, brought him out of miry clay, and set his feet on a rock. Insert your name there. That's your testimony. It's my testimony. It's our testimony. Every cult, every false religious system has man reaching up to God, trying to reach God, trying to reach God. Good luck. They got you knocking on doors, passing out little tablets. If you're unlucky enough to be a Mormon, you're wearing your holy underwear. <laughs> it's like, religion, what does it say? It says, I can get to heaven by my own efforts, by my own wisdom. Only Christianity, only Christianity says, I wasn't looking for God, but he reached down to me, to me. That's how much God loves us. Was anybody looking for God? No, and then he started talking to you, and he, hey, I'm right here. And he drew you through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he drew you close, and he saved our life. He brought us in. That is love. Did we deserve it? No, I had no intention of stopping to sin. But he kept talking to me, and he convicted me, and he drew me in. Praise God, because he did that for all of us. Amen. Satan has silenced you, shut his mouth when? When the blood is applied on the doorpost of your heart and the testimony of grace is shared, it's still, if you're still there, you're trying to impress God with anything that you do, don't do, the enemy's going to beat you like a drum. It's not about your efforts. It's all about grace. You have to come to the place where the word of my testimony is grace, grace, nothing but grace. It's not about relying on my performance it's all about his grace. The reason why people aren't getting blessed is because they're constantly monitoring their own spiritual condition, always asking themselves, how's my walk? Is it strong enough for God to use me? How am I doing? Have I done enough good spiritual stuff today? 
I go work in the nursery enough? Will God bless me now? So what do we do? We forget about our efforts and we let God bless us for no reason. We let him use us regardless of what we think, regardless of how we feel because our feelings don't matter. Now, am I talking, am I talking about giving you a license to sin? Absolutely not. This is not a license to sin. If you're truly saved, you're going to bear fruit. And this is where I take a slight detour, not in my notes. Remember Balaam? That guy's an enigma. I still have problems trying to figure him out. He's a prophet, but he was really, really screwed up on his best day. He gets hired to go curse the children of Israel. You know the story. He goes up to the mountain, and I tell him, curse him. But every time he opens up his mouth, what happens? Nothing but fabulous blessings on God's people. Was it because they deserved it? No, it's because they're God's people. God just wants to bless them. He does not want to hurt them. He just wants to bless his people. And by the way, I keep telling you guys, someday map that out, take the way they're camped and map out the number of people. And when he's looking down, all you see is them camped in the shape of a cross. He missed it. He missed it. It's all about the blood. It's all about the cross. He could not curse God's people. Now, for those of you that are thinking, I'm saved, I'm going to live any way I want. Little tidbit as I take my little detour here. Balaam told that other king that wanted to curse him, I can't curse him, but they can curse themselves. How do they do that? They can go out and they can get involved in sin on their own, and they can breathe a curse on themselves. So he went out and he got all the little honeys from his side to go in there, and uh, uh, it didn't end well. They got involved in all this pagan worship and sin, and they brought a curse on themselves through the way they lived. Sin, even though you're saved, has repercussions. And if you plant that seed, it's going to grow up. But in our walk, just let the Lord bless you. Give in to him. If you really love the Lord, you're going to bear fruit. Anybody here ever look at an apple tree? Anybody seen an apple tree? Or if you haven't, insert fruit tree here. Did that fruit tree look like it was struggling to bear fruit? Did it really look like, oh, man, apples, apples, apples? No. It just stood there soaking up the sun, taking in whatever water it could get, and growing apples. Same thing with you. You just sit there. Let the Lord love on you. If you truly love the Lord, you are going to bear fruit. Stop focusing on everything around. Quit listening to the devil telling you you're not good enough. He can't use you. I know what you did last week. You know, just get in there. Jump in the nursery. Jump into your ministry. Do whatever the Lord puts on your heart and let him bless you. This is how you're really going to grow to understand the length, the breadth, the width of what God did for you at the cross. And you're going to bear fruit. How did they overcome the enemy? By the word of a testimony, and their testimony is what? Grace. Grace. So now you overcame the enemy. Let's talk about binding Satan. Rendering him powerless. How do I do that? Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years. Now John 12, 31, what does it say? So Satan is called the prince of the world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul calls him the god of this world. These descriptions used by Jesus, Paul tells us, not only is Satan real, but he's actually the reason why a lot of bad stuff is happening in the world. It's not God. The first thing people say when there's tornadoes or anything oh an act of God no God has nothing to do with it Satan is the prince of this world it's his domain not for long the Bible's clear when it says these are not acts of God in this verse how many angels did it take to bind Satan one one angel and since the Bible tells us that we're going to rule over angels what does it mean means you, me, us, we got authority over angels. 
Amen? You gotta step out. So sometimes you can feel like every little evil force is coming against you. Coming against your family, coming against your job, coming against your emotions. Problems at work that seem like they are never gonna be able to get the victory over. In your spirit, sometimes you're just mourning. Man, there's nothing I can do about this thing. I can't overcome it. Maybe I'm going to have to live with these issues, anger, insert the, the problem anywhere you want. Maybe I'm going to have to live with it until the day the Lord takes me home to heaven. Not so. You don't have to live with sadness, depression. Okay, follow me here. Matthew 16, verses 16 to 18. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The gates of Hades shall not prevail doesn't mean that the gates are going to hound you around and start chasing you down the street until you finally get home to go to heaven. Anybody ever see gates chasing anybody? Doesn't happen. Why? Gates are just objects. They're just a physical object. In Matthew 16, Jesus is not talking about the ability of gates of hell to track you down, chase you down, and beat you down. He's talking about their inability to keep you out. They're a barrier. In other words, we can take ground that seems to be controlled by hell. Jesus is trying to shed more light on this when he gives us a parable, when he says, here's the understanding. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man, then he will plunder his house? Any good criminal is going to tell you that if you want to break into somebody's house, you better tie him up. You better get control of them. In the parable, Satan is the strong man. And if you're going to take something out of his control, what do you got to do? You got to bind him. You got to render him so that he's ineffective. Now, somebody's going to say, I got to be doing something wrong. I'm going to church. I'm praying. I'm singing. I'm just not getting the goods. What's going on? Jesus said, unless the strong man is bound, you're never going to be able to get the goods. How's the strong man bound in your life? How's he bound in your marriage, in your emotions? Maybe you're struggling with anger or whatever. Insert problem here. How is he bound? It's a question each of us has to answer. And the next question is, how are we going to do it? Second Kings, back to the Old Testament. Are you seeing a trend here? There's another New Testament principle in Old Testament picture. Second Kings chapter 6. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, he's warring against Israel. He makes a plan, and he says, I'm going to go ambush Israel. Knowing this, the prophet Elijah, what does he do? He warns the king of Israel every time. He keeps telling him. What do you think Ben-Hadad is doing? He's getting frustrated. Somebody, I must have a spy. Every time I want to destroy Israel, somebody's telling him something. This happens two more times. Ben-Hadad is now determined to find out who's the traitor, who's been talking to the king of Israel. Somebody steps up and they say, hey, your majesty, the problem is there's a prophet in Israel named Elijah, and he's the reason why everything we talk about, the king of Israel knows. So Ben-Hadad sends his troops to the city of Dothan, either to bring back Elijah or wipe it out. When Gehazi, Elijah's servant, wakes up in the morning, what does he see? He sees the enemy surrounding the city, completely surrounded. What do you think? He's scared. Elijah tells him, don't worry. Yeah, that's a lot of comfort. For they that are with us are more than they that are with them. So what do you think is going through Gehazi's mind? Probably something like, hey, if you're looking around, it's just me and you, and you're an old guy. So Elijah is probably remembering what David wrote in Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Do you fear him? 
You don't see it, but he's camped around you right now. Fear the Lord. Love the Lord. He's protecting you. You can't see it, but he's there. So Elijah prayed that the Lord would open Gehazi's eyes. The Lord did. And what happened? He saw that the Syrians were actually the ones that were surrounded, completely surrounded. Horses of chariots of fire going around. Do you think he's worried now? No. Not knowing they're surrounded, the Syrians move forward, coming toward Elisha. What does he do? He prays that they would be blinded. And what happens? They're blinded. So now they're blinded. They can't see anything. What does Elijah do? This is kind of cute. He says, hey, guys, you're in the wrong place. Let me take you to the guy you're looking for. Okay, thanks for the help. Elijah had previously told the king of Israel about the ambushes that the Syrians were, were planning. And they wanted to wipe out God's people. But these guys were really looking to kill the king of Israel. They wanted to wipe him out. Now, when they get there, the Lord opens up his eyes and the blinded Syrian army is looking around. How shocked do you think they were? Pretty shocked, right? Here I am right in the middle of all the guys that want, I wanted to wipe out. The king... Looks at, looks at the army and tells uh, Elijah, what should I do? Want to kill him? What does Elijah say? No. No way. Would you do that? I Personally, I would have probably said, yeah, wipe him out now. We got him. Elijah says no. And here's the principle, guys. Because next he says, go on. Get him some food and set it before him. Feed him. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 18 to 23 says that when they drank and they ate to their fill, they let them go. They went back. And you know what? They never, never bothered Israel again. Never. When I first read this, I didn't get this principle. The principle here, this is how you bind Satan. How? Elisha didn't run around. He didn't start shaking his finger. He didn't do all this. He didn't jump up and say, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan. No, he didn't do none of this stuff. Elisha bound Satan in a totally different way. He chose to feed them instead of fight them. Now, Old Testament picture, right? New Testament principle. Paul elaborates on it. Romans 12.20. I know you've read it. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. There's your principle. And in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. In biblical days, before they invented matches, if your fire went out, what did you do? You went to your neighbor's house and you said, hey, can I have some of your coal to relight my fire? So when she goes to the neighbor and she asks for live coals to put in the little urn and take it back home at her neighbor's house, she carries it back on her head to rekindle her fire. What are they doing? They're heaping coals on their head. It doesn't mean that you're trying to get back at your neighbor by doing this. You're trying to, it doesn't mean you're trying to literally smoke them. It's an act of generosity. It's an act of kindness. Once again, Old Testament, what did they do? They fed him rather than fight him. New Testament, what does Jesus say? Love him. Love him. Now, Paul in Romans 12, 21, do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Do you see the trend here all through the Bible? Overcome it with good. John, the prophet of love, what is he saying? Love him. Love each other. Love your neighbor. It's hard. Overcoming evil, binding Satan, it's not a phrase we say. It's a deed that we do. It's an action. Jesus models it in Matthew 12, 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Jesus didn't sit there and grill the guy. He didn't ask him about his unconfessed sin. He didn't ask him about his lack of faith. He didn't ask him about what he's been doing. You messing with tarot cards, Ouija boards, what are you doing? He didn't do any of this. 
He just did good. He healed the guy. Didn't jump around yelling, I bind Satan, nothing. He just healed him. He just did good. He did good, and what did he do? He demonstrated it to us. This is what we're supposed to go. Don't worry about the other stuff. Do good. Love people. He's our example of total goodness. He's our picture of how to bind Satan. Now, this isn't a new concept. God is a God of love, saying, love your neighbors as you love yourself. 1 Corinthians, if I don't have love, I am nothing. And if someone at work is driving you crazy, what do you do? So hard to do. Bring some donuts into the office. Bring some donuts into the office and, you know what, buddy? (laughs) I got you donuts. Maybe they're going to drive you crazy for a while, but eventually, love them, love them. If your wife's grumpy, take her out to dinner. Better yet, make her dinner and then follow it up by doing the dishes. You think she's going to love you? Absolutely. Man, husbands, you haven't learned this? <laughs> uh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Okay, guys, look at The issues of life are always going to be there. The principle, if you want to come overcome evil, you got to do it with good, okay? That's how we bind Satan. That's how they do it, by doing good things, kind things, generous things. The things that your natural inclination, I want to smoke them. Don't smoke them. Heap coals on their head. The enemy is bound when you stop criticizing, backbiting, judging others, and you just live out the way Jesus wants you to live. He's our example. The woman at the well, when she came to Jesus, what did Jesus say? He didn't sit there and start telling her, you know, hey, I want you to cut off the guys you're with. I want you to quit doing this and start running out of the list. He just said, hey, you want to drink? Come on, drink of me. Learn about me. He didn't, he didn't give them a whole big, big list of do's and don'ts. When I told you earlier about you're not going to be able to live up to any standard of doing or doing or that of doing something or not doing something. It is all about Jesus' finished work at the cross. It's all about submitting to the love that he's already shed in your life and taking advantage of that grace that he's pouring out to you. If you give the grace free reign in your life, you will not want to do the things that used to drive your life. You can't change your, you, you can't change your heart. Remember that story? You can't change your heart. Like I tell, I used to go to jail and I used to tell the guys all the time, why do dogs bark? Because they're dogs. It's in their nature. You can't change your nature. Dogs bark because it's their nature. You can't change your sinful nature, but you can change your mind. And if you change your mind, God will change your heart. Okay? This is the work that's going on in each and every one of our lives. Some of us are farther along this road of sanctification than others, but we're all on that road. Don't get hung up when the devil comes up to you and says, I can't, you can't do that. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You know, no, you're right. You're right. Agree with him. Step on. Step on and let the Lord use you. You will be surprised what he will do in your life if you just turn it over and say, you're right. What do you want me to do, Lord? I'm just your instrument. And then he'll do it. He'll change your heart, and where he takes your life will be phenomenal. Amen? Amen. (laughs) I'm sorry, guys. The cue cards are going up. i got to start laughing. (laughs) Thank you, Brother Fred. Okay, listen. uh, uh, Why don't you guys keep Pastor Angel up in prayer? You know he has a procedure. You know, in the loss of Fred, keep the Baruch family up. Amen. You know, Fred's an awesome brother, and he's having a much better time than we are. Amen. You know, he's actually with the Lord. What a lucky guy. It's hard. To... I can honestly say each of our lives were enriched because he was just such a good brother. But you know what? He wouldn't want us to be sad. He's just saying, you know what? See you in a little while. Because in a little while, we're all going to be there. In a thousand years, this is going to seem like one day or whatever. 
you know, so quick. And then we'll all be together and we'll all just be loving each other and enjoying the kingdom. It's going to be really cool. But for right now, it hurts. Keep the family up in prayer because the, the pain is real, you know, and it hurts. Um, keep Angel up in prayer for his surgery that all goes well. And uh, uh, Jesse, Brother Jesse. Jesse is one tough bird. Keep Jesse up in prayer. He had, a, uh, he had an issue just trying to, to breathe, so they had him in the hospital for a couple days. I think he's back home now, but keep, keep him up. Let's pray, guys. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and as we close out our service, we just pray that you will continue to bless Turning Point. Lord, bless the family, bless the fellowship, Lord. Father, we have so much going on in our, in our family right now, Lord, with the Baruchs and their loss, Lord. We just pray that you give Fred a big hug on our behalf, Lord. Love on him, Lord. We miss him. Brother, be with the family. Comfort them, Lord. Then give them a peace. Give them a joy, Lord, that passes understanding, Lord, as you step in, Father. Pray that you provide everything that's needed, Lord, in every way, the areas where we don't even know, Lord. You just step in and just hedge in the entire family. Pray for our pastor, Lord, and lift him up to you as he gets ready to go for surgery, that, Father, you are going to take him, Lord, and bring him back better than ever. Better than normal. Father, I pray that he's back in the pulpit preaching and teaching, Lord, and just bringing the word in a powerful, effective way, Lord. And right now, you'll give him peace, joy, comfort, and confidence as he walks into that surgery. You're right there next to him. Father, pray for Jesse. You'll heal him, Lord. Pray for the family, Lord, as we get ready to walk out of here. Pray that we'll meditate on this word, Lord, that we'll not only hear it, Lord, but that we'll apply it, Lord, that it'll come to our minds, Lord, at the proper time, that you'll help it to grow in our spirit, Lord, and develop us into the men and women that love you, love each other, Lord, and that people see it in our lives, Lord, and that we're a powerful tool in your arsenal for good in this world, Lord. Father, we lift it up now. Give everybody tra safe traveling mercies, Lord. In Jesus' name, shower everyone with grace, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, family.